Hello everybody, today we're gonna to talk about how to design your aggregates for your concrete mixture. This is kind of an advanced topic. Aggregates happen to make up about 70% of the volume of your concrete mixture. They're really important for lots of different stuff. The way our current mix design procedures treat them though, is like they're all the same. Or at least it doesn't allow you to get into the details of the nuances. It doesn't allow you to design your aggregates to get exactly what you want for the workability of your concrete. We're gonna talk about a lot of the classic procedures today. The title of today's talk is Comparing Aggregate Mixture Design Procedures for Concrete Mixtures. And I'd like to first and foremost thank my co-authors on this work. There's been a number of students from Oklahoma State University that have done an amazing job really looking at concrete mixtures, really trying to understand how aggregation affects the ultimate performance. You know, the particle size distribution, or what's known as the gradation, is shown to have great impacts on the workability of a concrete mixture. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let's look at these slides. All five of these show pictures of slump tests of concrete that's made on paper with what appears like the exact same ingredients, the same amount of cement, same amount of water, of rock, of sand, but the gradations are different. And as you can see, the workability is very different. This is hard to account for in our classic methods. We need more insights to what's going on. To look further, you can even look at the surface of these concretes. They just don't look the same. Again, the gradation of the aggregates inside the concrete mixture affects how the concrete performs and behaves. Again, another example why this is important. And even in really bad scenarios, you can get situations where you get extreme segregation. Here we're showing all the coarse aggregate going to one direction, all the paste going to another, another direction. This isn't good. This isn't good concrete. This isn't placeable concrete. This isn't constructible concrete. We need to redesign our concrete when things like this happen. We need to understand why does this happen? If we don't control the distribution of our aggregates, then the only thing that we can do to help make our concrete more workable is to add paste. That's cement and water. That's all we can do. And if that's the only thing we can do is if when one, we, we run into one of these unfortunate ag aggregations, if we just increase the paste content, it's not good for the durability or the cost of our concrete. So some questions that a lot of people like to ask when it comes to aggregate design is how do you proportion aggregates? How do you decide how much of each size to use? Are these packing models that people have used in the past, or are they useful? Is one better than another one? Do they really give us practical, useful answers? These are all questions that people don't really have great answers for. And that's what I hope to give you some insight in this presentation. Now, I'm not gonna give you all the details today. There's a whole paper that we've written that's gone, it goes into all the details of the testing, all the information, it's published, it's in the notes. I hope you look it up, I hope you read it. We're gonna today talk about the courses factor, the power 45, the percent retained charts, different packing models, dry rotted unit weight, and surface area of your aggregation and what impacts it has on the workability of your concrete mixture. The graphical methods, the three ones that we're gonna be talking about today. The courses factor, also known as the Shillstone chart, the power 45, and then also the percent retained. Let's start with the power 45. In this graph, you plot your sieve number at the bottom, and then you plot the percent passing, but you take your percent passing to the 0.45 power, okay? There's more details inside the paper that's below. 
This is a very, very common method. This is used in the asphalt world. It's been used in the concrete world for a long, long, long time. Okay, Fuller and Thompson were the first ones to ever think of this kind of concept. And you know what? I think if you were looking at packing marbles, perfect spheres, that this would be a great approach. But we don't have perfect spheres. For example, I, saw, I plot on this chart a bunch of different concrete mixtures that we've looked at that all of them have, that we've used a lot of different workability tests to determine that they have poor workability. And look, the data is just all over the place. And then these, these were all determined or deemed to have moderate workability, okay? And then these were all determined to have good workability, all right? Yet, how do we really compare these to one another? Is there a big difference between the moderate, the good, and the poor? For example, in this sea of black, sea of good performing mixtures, which a number of them are within the, the actual boundaries, but yet they aren't on this, this ideal black line, this ideal density line that you're supposed to shoot for when you're designing the, these actual concrete mixtures. They're all over the place. And look, this red line is a poor mixture. And can you really tell the difference between this poor mixture than with all these other ones that have great performance. Again, all of these have the same amount of water, cement, okay, and different amounts of aggregates, but the volume is the same. So on paper, it all looks the same, but we're changing the amount of coarse, intermediate size aggregate and fine aggregate around to get these different performances. So in summary, using a best fit line, that's that initial line in the dead center. Using the best fit line on the Power 45 doesn't show enough detail in the changes for the changes in slope in the gradation line. As what I'm trying to say here is that there's, there's something good going on here, but it seems to be the changes from the different points are really important. It's not just about following this middle line. And it doesn't really address the ranges of the fine and the coarse sand that you need inside your concrete mixture. In summary, I think there's some good concepts, but this plot is just missing some things. So let's keep moving. So in this plot, it's called the workability factor or the coarseness factor chart. Okay, There's a term called the coarseness factor that you plot on the x-axis. And then another term called the workability factor. Again, there's lots and lots of details in the paper below. There's these different zones. And these different zones are supposed to be different places where you're supposed to go for different types of performances, for different mixtures. A lot of DOTs, though, simplify this and say that you should be in this center box, zone two. And they'll even say you should be in a smaller box with inside zone two. Now, I've plotted several different mixtures here and where they fall inside the courses factor chart. And the red ones are poor performing mixtures by a number of different workability charts. The moderate ones are shown in yellow and the black ones are shown in good. So for these mixtures, it appears that somewhere above zone two does a better job than some of these other zones. But notice these two data points. Let's look at closely at those. Those two data points would predict and plot in the exact same place in the courses factor, but one of them is poor and one of them is good. But if we look at the aggregate gradations, we'll notice that they're very different. The one that's poor actually plucks its head above this 20% retained line, and the one that's good doesn't. That is a big clue. We'll talk more about that coming up because I think that 20% line is really important. So in summary, the limits in the courses factor chart do not always produce mixtures with satisfactory workability. And it's exasperating when you can have two mixtures that are right beside one another, but yet have drastically different workability performance in that chart. And this courses factor chart 
and these equations were a very good start. I, I really think they're onto something here. I think this is groundbreaking, important work, but I think they can be adjusted and improved. Let's talk about packing models. Now, these are ideal, idealistic models where you take the aggregates and you usually assume that they're spherical and you th talk about how they should pack together. There's lots and lots of different theories out there. We're going to evaluate the models by looking at how they would predict different concrete mixtures would perform. But we're going to compare the, the, the concrete mixtures by the amount of water reducer needed to have a desirable workability in a test called the box test that's used for concrete pavements. Let me show you what I mean. On the y-axis is the amount of water reducer it took to get satisfactory performance in the box test. We have some that have very high water reducer. That falls into the no way category. That means the water demand is super high. That's not good. Then we have some in the no category, the sum that we would not like to be within, and we'd love to be in this yes category. All of these mixtures are the same. They have the same amount of water, same amount of cement, same amount of paste, okay? Same volume of aggregates, right? But this is how the void content is reported based on the dry rotted unit weight. That means taking all of the fine and all of the coarse, mixing it up, mixing it up, mixing it up, putting it in a bucket, rotting it 25 times, smacking it another layer, rotting it 25 times, smacking it, you do that three times, you finish the top, make it smooth, and then you weigh how much material. And there's a lot of people that think that the lower the voids content or the higher the density or the lower the voids content on this chart, the better your concrete will, will perform. That is not what this data shows. This data shows that some of the ones with the lowest voids content had some of the worst performance. And some of the ones with the highest voids content had much better performance. And there's other people that have realized this in the past. And they said, well, it's not just about how tightly everything packs together. You have to come back and loosen the model, loosen everything up. And one of those is something called the modified twofer model. Again, it tries to loosen it up, tries to adjust for this phenomenon. But again, you would think the ones with the very lowest voids content in the twofer model would have the best performance. That is not the case. We have some with very similar voids content doing very poor in the no way category, and some that are performing great in the yes category. How can that be? Well, if we go on to another model, the De La Rod model, okay? Again, they have a different approach, this different idea of this loosening. And again, we have things that are very similar void content that have very, very different performance in the test. Some are in the no way category. Some are in the yes category. Some of them need almost no water reducer at all. But they have very, very similar voids content. So again, it doesn't seem like this is that helpful move on to surface area. Some people think that it's all about the amount of surface area inside the concrete mixture. And they would tell you that if you minimize the surface area, you're going to get improved workability. Now, the ones with the lowest surface area here falls in the no category, but I have many in the yes, and I have just as many in the no way and the no. And from the calculation sakes, there's no difference in a number of these different points, yet some of them are having great performance and some of them are having poor performance. Again, this is showing this kind of, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's not as reliable as we'd like it to be. So in summary, the packing models were not able to reliably predict the workability of the concrete. But what about the percent retain chart? That's one chart I've left out, and I've left it out for a reason. So in this chart, on the x-axis, we have the sieve number. This is the smaller, this is the larger, and this is the percent retained. And they have this envelope that goes up and goes down. And if you ask where this came, comes from, Jim Shillstone Sr. 
supposedly drew this on the back of an envelope quickly in a meeting. And he said he thought it showed promise. And I think he's right. For these mixtures, they're outside of the bounds, and the red means they were in the no-way category. They performed awful. But if you moved into the yellow, they're also in the no category. And again, they were awful. But the data points that performed well, that was the yes category. Every one of the great performing data points fell into the percent retained chart limits. We looked at all kinds of different models out there. And the only one that seemed to be right for the majority of the time was this percent retained. So the, re so the percent retained chart did a good job of indicating which gradations would have good performance. So while the percent retained looks promising, does it work for a wide range of mixtures? So by investigating the percent retained chart over in a lot more detail on over a lot more concrete mixtures is how we develop something called the tarantula curve. And I'm going to talk about it in my next video because I think it's really important. But this was a starting point. This was what we needed as the tip to tell us which direction to dig or, or to go. With that, there's a lot more information on this website. You can send me an email or go to my website and may the force be with you. Thanks.